Here's the vertebral column. It consists of 24 separate vertebrae, the sacrum, and the coccyx. There are seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, and five lumbar vertebrae. The sacrum consists of five vertebral segments fused together. The coccyx, or vestigial tail, consists of three or four tiny segments. The highest cervical vertebra articulates with the skull. The thoracic vertebrae articulate with the ribs, and the sacrum articulates with the two innominate bones to form the pelvis. When seen from in front, the spine appears straight. But when we look at it from the side, we see that it's markedly curved. The lower cervical vertebrae form a forward curve, the thoracic vertebrae form a backward curve, the lumbar vertebrae curve forward again, and the sacrum curves sharply backward. These pieces of material represent the intervertebral discs, which we'll be looking at shortly. There are marked differences between vertebrae of different regions, but they all have some basic features in common. We'll look at a typical thoracic vertebra to see what these features are. In front, this cylindrical mass of bone, the body of the vertebra, supports the weight of everything that's above it. Behind, there's a set of bony plates and projections which serve three functions, to protect the spinal cord, to give attachment to muscles and ligaments, and to articulate with the adjoining vertebrae. This arch of bone, the neural arch, encloses the spinal cord. The space that's surrounded by the arch and the back of the body is called the vertebral foramen. The series of vertebral foramina create the tubular space that contains the spinal cord. The space is called the vertebral canal. This part of the neural arch is called the lamina. This part is the pedicle. There's a small notch in the upper edge of the pedicle and a larger notch in the lower edge. Together, the notches above and below form this opening on each side, the intervertebral foramen. A spinal nerve emerges through each intervertebral foramen. Arising from the neural arch are three large bony projections called processes. A spinous process in the midline, a transverse process on each side. Also arising from the neural arch are four articular processes two above and two below. The lower ones face forward, the upper ones face backward. The articular processes of adjoining vertebrae interlock, forming a pair of synovial joints which permit movement between adjoining vertebrae. Here's a typical cervical vertebra, the fourth one. The body is small. The upper surface of the body is curved, somewhat in the shape of a saddle. The lower surface has the same curvature in reverse. The vertebral foramen is large and triangular. The neural arch is formed mainly by the two straight laminae. The pedicles are very short. The spinous process is short and ends in a double point. The upper articular facets face upward and inward. The lower ones face downward and forward. The mass of bone between the articular facets is called the articular pillar. The transverse processes arise from the side of the body and also from here on the articular pillar. The transverse process of a cervical vertebra has a hole in it, the transverse foramen, through which the vertebral artery passes. 
The transverse process is shaped like a gutter pointing downwards. It ends in two tubercles, an anterior and a posterior, where the scalene muscles attach. Of the seven cervical vertebrae, the first two, which are called the atlas and the axis, differ from the others in several ways. We'll see them in detail in volume four of this atlas. The seventh cervical vertebra also differs from the others in that it has a long spinous process, ending in a single point, which forms this small prominence on the back of the neck. The cervical vertebrae form the most mobile part of the spine, partly because of the curved shape of their bodies, which makes flexion and extension easy, and partly because of the shallow slope of their articular processes, which makes lateral flexion easy. The movements that can occur in the cervical spine are forward flexion, extension, and lateral flexion to one side or the other. Rotation also occurs in the neck. Almost all of it happens at the specialized joints between the atlas and the axis vertebrae, which we'll look at in the tape on the head and neck, volume four of this atlas. In that tape, we'll also look at the way the atlas vertebra articulates with the bone that forms the underside of the skull, the occipital bone. The joints between the atlas and the occipital bone are called the atlanto-occipital joints. The thoracic vertebrae become progressively more massive from above down, as they do from the top to the bottom of the vertebral column. Each of the thoracic vertebrae articulates with a pair of ribs. On each side, the vertebra articulates with the rib at two points. Here, at the end of the transverse process, and here, where the pedicle meets the body. We'll be looking at the ribs in the second section of this tape. The transverse processes of the thoracic vertebrae point sideways. The spinous processes point downwards, each one overlapping the one below. The articular processes are almost vertical. The upper ones face almost straight backwards. The lower ones, flexion, lateral flexion, and perhaps surprisingly, rotation. The transverse processes are small. The spinous process is broad and points almost straight backwards. The upper articular processes of lumbar vertebrae face inward. The lower ones face outward. Because of this arrangement, there's almost no rotation between lumbar vertebrae. The movements that can occur in the lumbar spine are flexion, extension, and lateral flexion to either side. Here's the sacrum together with the coccyx. The sacrum is formed by five vertebrae fused together. From top to bottom, it has a marked backward curve. When we're standing upright, the sacrum is oriented just as we see it here. The upper part of this backward-facing dorsal surface is angled at about 45 degrees to the vertical. The upper part of this forward-facing pelvic surface is more nearly horizontal than vertical. On the dorsal surface, there are two articular processes for the fifth lumbar vertebra. The lowest intervertebral disc is quite wedge-shaped. Its shape accounts in part for the very marked curvature of the spine between the fourth lumbar vertebra and the sacrum. 
The most anterior point on the sacrum is called the sacral promontory. The vertebral canal continues down the back of the sacrum. From within the vertebral canal, the anterior rami of the spinal nerves, S1 to S4, emerge from these pelvic sacral foramina. The posterior rami emerge from these dorsal sacral foramina. The vertebral canal ends at this opening, the sacral hiatus, that's shaped like an upside-down V. This curved auricular surface articulates on each side with the upper part of the innominate bone, or hip bone, to form the pelvis. The joints between the sacrum and the hip bones are the sacroiliac joints. These joints permit almost no movement. The broad ridge on each hip bone adjoining the sacrum is the iliac crest. It's an important muscle attachment, as we'll see shortly. Intervertebral disc. The disc is a massive pad of fibrocartilage that's firmly attached to the vertebral body above and below, all the way around the circumference. If we cut through a disc and look at it from above, we see that it's made of concentric layers of material. The disc consists of an outer ring of tough fibrocartilage called the annulus fibrosus and a soft center of almost liquid material called the nucleus pulposus. The disc is solid enough to transmit the weight of the body and it's flexible enough to permit movement between the vertebrae. The side of the intervertebral disc forms the anterior margin of the intervertebral foramen, through which the spinal nerve emerges in ligaments. First, the interspinous ligaments. Here they are. They run from the lower edge of one spinous process to the upper edge of the next one. Now we'll add the supraspinous ligament to the picture. The supraspinous ligament merges with the interspinous ligaments. It runs the whole length of the vertebral column, connecting the tips of the spinous processes. The supraspinous ligament serves as a midline attachment for some important muscles, as we'll see later. These ligaments help to limit flexion of the spine. The ligamentum flavum lies on the front of the laminae. To see it, we'll cut through the pedicles of all the vertebrae along this line and look at the laminae from the inside. Here's the ligamentum flavum. It goes from one lamina to the next, all the way down the spine. Here, where it's been cut through, we can see how thick it is. The ligamentum flavum is made of yellowish fibroelastic tissue, hence its name, which means yellow ligament. The anterior longitudinal ligament covers the front and sides of the vertebral bodies. It runs the whole length of the vertebral column. We'll cut through it along this line to see it better. The anterior longitudinal ligament is thick and strong. It's attached to the upper and lower edges of each vertebral body. It limits extension of the spine. In extension, the tightness of the anterior longitudinal ligament helps to prevent backward and forward movement of the vertebral bodies relative to each other. The posterior longitudinal ligament runs along the back of the vertebral bodies. To see it, we'll divide the pedicles along this line again and look at the bodies by themselves. Here's the posterior longitudinal ligament. It's narrow where it overlies each body and it widens out to cover the back of each disc. The posterior longitudinal ligament helps in a small way to limit flexion of the vertebral column. Each posterior joint is surrounded by a capsular ligament, which is loose enough to permit the small amount of movement that occurs between any two vertebrae. The capsular ligament has no great strength, but the articular processes themselves are strong. 
Because the upper ones face forward and the lower ones backward, the articular processes prevent the vertebra above from slipping forward relative to the vertebra below. Here's a cervical vertebra, a thoracic vertebra, and a lumbar vertebra. Here are the body, the vertebral canal, the pedicle, the lamina, the transverse processes, the spinous process, the articular processes, and the intervertebral foramen. In the cervical vertebra, here's the anterior tubercle and the posterior tubercle of the transverse process, and here's the transverse foramen. Here's the sacrum, the coccyx, the pelvic sacral foramina, the dorsal sacral foramina, and the sacral hiatus. Here's an intervertebral disc, the annulus fibrosus, and the nucleus pulposus. Here are the interspinous and supraspinous ligaments, the ligamentum flavum, the posterior longitudinal ligament, and the anterior longitudinal.